Samurais were the military elite of medieval and early modern Japan. But how did they really look like? Maybe something like this. When modern Asian actors play the roles of samurais, they will look like this. However, I would like to introduce to you Okubo Tosimiti, who was a hereditary samurai from Satsuma. So this video will be about what kind of distortions of the history could have led to such a terrible misunderstanding. And that's why we'll try to go as far as possible back in the Japanese history, before the Asian race populated the islands. Back then, they were completely different creatures. And completely different people. Long before the arrival of the Asian race on the Japanese islands, the local inhabitants were Caucasian people, the Aino people. As of today, the Aino people are almost completely blended with the Asian race and have lost almost completely their ethnic identity. But there are still some clues of their traditional philosophy and their view of life, and those point towards a clear connection with the culture which we call the culture of the survivors, a worldwide civilization or a group of people which sent its representatives worldwide to blend in with the simple local people. And that's why the views of the Ainos, philosophy, cosmology, dharma, and everything else, is exactly like that of other native people who live many thousands of kilometers away. The fact that the original inhabitants of the island were Caucasian is not denied in Japan, as they try to do in China and Siberia, where they killed them all a long time ago. And when Caucasian mummies of very tall people are being dug up, they pretend as if nothing happened and they don't change the history of the regions. So in Japan, somehow, the Ainos survived. But still, not enough research is done to determine their real place in history, because that will trigger the revelations about how and why the population of such a vast area, which includes Siberia, Central Asia, China, and so on, so that the purpose of erasing the memory about the culture of the survivors, the official historians are not encouraged to delve much into the real history of the indigenous people. Instead, they always give very superficial information about the latest inhabitants, the current inhabitants, and they tried to create the impression that they were the only inhabitants ever there. And in terms of the concepts of various waves of survivors, a concept that we reviewed in the episode about America, it seems that the Aino belonged towards the earlier waves that we know of. Now, let's see a bit more about the last wave. This is a Portuguese world map dated at the year 1623 and the maker considered Japan to be a Christian country, that is why he placed this big cross over the Japanese islands. And this map maker was not the only one. The island, which is nowadays called Hokkaido, had a different name uh, in the Middle Ages and the name was Yesu, which sounds like Jesus the Slavic name of Jesus Christ and to make it even uh, more clear they have put a Christian cross on it. This is yet another map showing the same island and here it is written as 
Jesu, which sounds even closer to Jesus, the Slavic name of Jesus Christ. So what's the problem of having Christianity in Japan in the past? Why is it removed from the mainstream history? The reason for removing all traces of Christianity in Japan was to erase the memory of the people who brought it there. As we are gonna see in the future episodes, these were men, the last who remained alive from the defeated army of the last nation, which refused to accept the rule of the parasitic forces, which kept the records of the real history of the human races, and which, as we're gonna see in the next episode about China, still had some of the abilities that now we call supernatural, of course for them they were natural, and they had those abilities because of the connection with Hyperborea, which probably was one of the cultures or civilizations which served as a basis for the legend of what we call now collectively Atlantis. Of course, the official Japanese history has undergone parasitic uh, corrections, but still, few forgotten facts here and there may help us reconstruct the real scenario. Exactly when in Russia, uh, the last strongholds of the survivors uh, were destroyed. At that time, in Japan appears a ruler called Togukawa Yesu. It is possible that uh, his name points towards the fact that he was a Christian, Yesu, Jesus, Jesus. When Togukawa Yesu starts ruling, Japan all of a sudden decides to sever all connections with the external world and remain a completely closed country. Most likely, the defeated survivors from Siberia sought refuge in a faraway, relatively isolated land on an island. A land in the east, the east, where the influence of the survivors' culture was always stronger. And that's why the Ainu were not completely exterminated over there back then, as was the case in Siberia and Central Asia. Even according to the official history of Japan, at that time, the country was greatly influenced by the so-called Rusui, which sounds very similar to Rusi, which not so long time ago in the Slavic languages was used to point towards the people of what we call Russia nowadays. Even in the Latin languages, the connection is still clear, Rusi, Russians. And as we are going to see in the future episodes, these Rusi were running, fleeing their own land. Because what we call nowadays Russia is not as old as they want us to think. And it was artificially created, so to say, to replace another country, the biggest on earth, and yet a country that you will not find even a single sentence about in your standard history. In the official history of Japan, they conveniently simply don't mention where the Russians came from. The center of the Rusoi was Edo, and we see some buildings there that really don't fit in the Japanese style of architecture. Traditionally, the Asian population of Japan used to construct their buildings out of wood, not stone. The choice of material is not the most important. Most importantly, we see how in the history of building in Japan, all of a sudden, without any prior evolution, we see full-fledged, elegant, megalithic stone masonry, which is a distinct signature of the survivors. That is how they built their buildings all over the world. This is St. Petersburg in Russia. This is Saxo Herman, Peru. This is Norba, Italy. Polygonal megalithic building masonry is a very peculiar building style where each stone is uniquely shaped and yet fits all the neighboring stones with amazing accuracy. 
The chance that this style is evolved independently, is in various locations all around the world, is very close to zero. Again, the faces on these portraits are not exactly what we call Japanese. This is how contemporary artists depicted the kings of Japan, the shoguns. They were the rulers of uh, the samurais and continued their reign until the middle of 19th century uh, when the colonial military forces destroyed the last strongholds of the old culture. And their outfits as well are clearly Mughal style. So this is funny, it says comedy in Japan and then we have these people with clearly European faces and outfits performing something. Since the actual mission of the European Reformation was to obliterate, kill, destroy anybody or anything who had any connection or knowledge of this culture of the survivors or the wisdom left by the previous advanced civilizations on earth in any form. That's why they didn't hesitate to go to such a faraway place and establish a new order of things in a country which didn't need them at all and basically lived peacefully and self-sufficiently. The wipeout of the samurais is presented in the Skarigir version of history as the Meiji Restoration and um, that is supposed to be a return uh, towards some previously forgotten ideologies, values and political structures. Very little information, very little importance is given to this uh, uh, moment in history when they teach it in the Japanese schools. They go through it very briefly and superficially. And it is presented to be some sort of uh, local for Japan uh, event. And maybe there will be some very vague hint towards the European ships that appeared on the shore of Japan at that time. Indeed, in some Japanese textbooks, they are presented as merchants' ships that were helping by giving donations of rice. Rice sounds so innocent, but there were other things besides the rice. But fortunately, there are always people who are brave enough to stand for the truth. And that's why we have a book which tells a completely different story about these foreign ships off the shore of Japan. A story which matches the historic photographs and artifacts much better. Black Ships of Japan. Quite an ambiguous title by itself. So what we read there is that Commodore Perry arrived in Edo in 1853 and brought a letter from Philomor, the President of the United States, demanding in absolutely straightforward language to put an end to the isolation of Japan and open it to the rest of the world in every way. Perry returned next year and demanded this to be done immediately. 
the people of Japan did not wish to step back from their way of life, from their tradition and ideology. However, the story continues. They changed their mind after they encountered the English military force. Well, as a result of this military encounter, the samurais were defeated and the Japanese society was forced to accept the Western way of life and to reform their traditional views. So this is the true meaning of the Meiji Restoration, threaten Japan by military force and making it a part of the cobweb of the parasitic rule which engulfed the earth at that point almost completely. So in the modern Japanese textbooks, as we said, it is called a return to old values, this major restoration. What do they mean old? Do they mean like the times of Atlantis, when a very similar thing happened? People used to live in harmony with nature, and then the parasitic influence infected everything and made it rot completely. In the set material of Jane Roberts, this set personality clearly warns us that we may do the same, that we may follow this sad example of Atlantis. The last group of samurais was killed in 1868 in town of Aizu Wakamatsu in northern Japan. Nowadays, in the castle of Aizu Wakamatsu, there is a museum. In this museum, there is a huge uh, um, piece of art depicting the very last moments of the samurais. And of course, they are um, shown as uh, belonging to the Asian race, because this is just a modern piece of art. So the attention of the visitors is attracted to the big modern statues and not many of them notice a small photograph which is found in one of the minor shrines of the complex. This gentleman was also a real samurai, not some actor playing as samurai. He took part in some of the last samurai battles when he was young and as you can see again European features. If you visit the valley of Aizu even nowadays, you will meet on the street a lot of local people with purely European faces, but of course most of them would be a mixture between Asians and Caucasians. As I was researching this topic, I found uh, Japanese people posting on forums questions why I look European, why I'm a Caucasian, I'm Japanese and yet I do not look like Japanese. I noticed the questions, I didn't see any answers in the forums. We also see the crescent symbol on the head of the samurais, which was one of the main symbols of the empire and the culture of the survivors. And this is an authentic, genuine samurai outfit. So in this museum, in the Tsurugachu castle in Aizu Wakamatsu. As I mentioned earlier, there is this huge piece of art, maybe like a real life-size statues of the last moments of the samurais as they commit seppuku, ceremonial su suicide, when the enemies are about to enter the room in which they are. So, okay, the samurais themselves are depicted as Asians, but even on this piece of art, 
Surprise, surprise! Who is standing at the threshold? Who is the enemy which is about to enter the room and that's why they commit suicide? It is a person with clearly Caucasian features dressed in um, some sort of military uniform, maybe something like Napoleon's uniform, something of that sort. So Anatoly Fomenko, on whose research the most interesting stuff in this episode is based, he describes his visit to this uh, museum. So he was accompanied by colleagues, Japanese historians, and when they reached this scene, um, he pointed at this uh, European person who was causing the suicide of the samurais and asked them who is he. At this point, the Japanese historians, uh, they pretended that they don't understand well the speech of uh, foreigners and uh, yeah, couldn't answer for this reason, although even a beginner in English will very well understand the question, who is he? The true face of the so-called local Meiji restoration in Japan, the very truth is that some of the last survivors were most brutally and, and barbarically killed by Europeans. These Europeans had the blood of the survivors also flowing in their veins, but they were zombified by the fraudulent parasitic propaganda that packages cruelty, inhumane cruelty, in uh, calling it patriotism and other names that have nothing to do with the essence. There is nothing patriotic about going halfway across the globe to murder peaceful population, which is completely unknown to you and leads a noble life in harmony with nature. So how come the historic quarters of the most important Japanese towns look exactly like European cities? Of course, the official sources will assure you that it was built all after Japan accepted the Western influence, but that doesn't make much sense for many reasons. First of all, by the time the actual influence was felt in the real life in Japan, the Western influence, the neoclassical style, and that's the official name of this style, it's again very misleading, this style was already going out of fashion. And we are not talking about just the main municipal and administrative buildings in these cities, we are talking about entire large quarters. And not only the buildings, but the entire layout of the quarters with the straight geometrical patterns in the planning, which is an absolutely compulsory feature of all these neoclassical cities found all over the world. This is very important because it proves that we are not talking about cleaning up certain areas and replacing it with such buildings as the Western influence gets stronger. And by the way, would you really believe that the traditional Japanese people, which are relatively at least traditional till date, would demolish to the ground the entire central parts of already established cities, parts which hypothetically, following the logic of this scenario, would have contained the best examples of their traditional architecture and replace it all with the styles of newcomers which are not very well welcomed there and a style which, as I said, is anyway going out of fashion. There are quite few star forts in Japan as well 
Now, this type of architecture was prevalent actually all over the world, but that was centuries ago when Japan was supposedly absolutely isolated, first of all, according to official sources, because it was very primitive, and second of all, when the Rusuis arrived and announced that Japan is cut off from the world, closed for external connections. If the official history of Japan, which they are selling to us, was true, all these star forts and the new classical large quarters should not have existed for sure. Overbuilding has always been a problem in Japan. For example, this is an old photograph which shows the state of affairs in terms of overbuilding, more or less at the time when Japan got opened for the Western world. So the centers of the major cities would have been at least this much crowded in terms of buildings. So if there was a demolition of uh, all the central areas, the main areas of these cities, I mean, there should have been something recorded in history about such an unbelievable scale of demolition. No. The truth is that uh, it was these Rusuis who brought this style with them. And their brothers, so to say, brought it all over the world. We, ha we saw the same problem in America. Again, uh, same style of buildings. And again, the explanation was very, very fishy. And now combine all this with the artificial 1000 years, which were added to the mainstream history which means that many of the empires and exotic kingdoms which we have been conditioned to believe were ancient actually existed uh, hundreds of years ago then everything falls into place actually and the full story of the so-called new classical style looks much more sensible it's not that the people all of a sudden felt nostalgia and started building in a style which was forgotten for many, many centuries. So people used to build in this very same way 2000 years ago and then all of a sudden 200 years ago they adopted the same style without any change. And on the top of that, very importantly, as we are going to see in the future episodes, they used the same techniques. Now here it gets very suspicious. Very, very suspicious because the official academics are telling us, oh, 2000 years ago they used something we are not sure what, we can't really replicate it nowadays. And then we see the absolutely same technique, again unknown to us, in buildings built 200 years ago in St. Petersburg. So this is a photograph of the aftermath of the nuclear devastation in Japan. Not only in the background we see a building, the style of which looks very awkward along the official Scaligerian history of Japan, but also in the foreground the head doesn't look less awkward. Its features are not particularly Japanese. Very interestingly, more than 80% of Japanese got are originally Indian goat. If you are neither Japanese or Indian, maybe you will not recognize, but this is not Japanese chanting. This is like a real Indian Hindu chant. So, in this documentary, there is a rich evidence that uh, what is commonly known as uh, traditional Japanese Buddhism is nothing else but a branch of the Hinduism. Here, on this contemporary depiction of Japan, we see the deities of Brahma and Shiva, which we are automatically conditioned to connect only with India, but in reality they are worshipped all over Southeast Asia and apparently in Japan as well. This is the four-headed Lord Brahma, 
the engineer of our universe. As you can see, a traveler who was making illustrations of Japan saw the same thing as we see on the old Indian statue. This really looks like Shiva and Parvati sitting on his lap. That's how he's depicted till date in India with Parvati on his lap and uh, the Rudraksha is a typical attribute of Shiva. The large Rudraksha beads are seen on both Indian and Japanese depictions and also the moon symbol again, the main symbol of Shiva. It's always in the Indian and in the Japanese depiction. This is nothing else but the Lord God Varaha in Japan, also considered an incarnation of the Supreme Lord in India. Here a Japanese temple with all these multi-headed deities typical for Hinduism at least from what we were taught in school. So here we see a Japanese bowing down to some uh, foreign looking statues and let's see the inscription below it Kan Roy. Well Kan by itself is the Mughal name for a ruler. Roy means king. So yeah, this is the king. And what is he bowing down to? Deva. And yes, that is the Hindi word for God. So when they were making up the history of all nations, not only Japan, they always used the same trick. Ignore obvious parallels and make things look as if they developed locally. Everything, religion, culture, governments. Why? First of all, people would look more stupid, yeah? unable to communicate between continents, between faraway kingdoms. And that's why they are always depicted as developing separately, yeah? to look primitive. Second of all, this feeds the idea that we have always been separated and now it's easier to trap us into stupid nationalism. In this way, they can easily organize us into suicidal wars. And so we are drawn into inflicting more and more self-organized tragedies upon ourselves. As we sit and watch Hollywood movies daily, subtly into us is implanted every day little by little that all these um, excessive military projects of all kinds and description are being carried out for the purpose of defending us from our neighbors. And yes, sometimes the military will be used for that purpose, but very rarely. Its real purpose is destruction of anything godly and beautiful found amongst the human race as a whole. And back to religion. The official history of Japan doesn't really deny this connection with Hinduism. It just considers it so remote and vague that in reality even the modern Japanese themselves are not aware of it at all. They don't know that in essence they are Hindus themselves. And presenting the religion of Japan in wrong light nowadays is also very important for those who have interest in keeping the human race submerged in ignorance. And when we start tracing the root of what we call Hinduism nowadays, the people, the Hindus themselves, call it Sanatana Dharma, when we take a close look at that, one thing leads to another, and again, at the end we find the root and the survivors of Hyperborea, which may also be connected to Atlantis. And here it is how. So it is not that the people who live in India came up with all this uh, knowledge of Sanatana Dharma, Vedic scriptures, Hinduism, all this is very synonymous. So the people don't even claim that they came up with this. It was given to them by rishis or sages 
wise men who appeared amongst them specifically with the purpose to come and educate them. So where did these wise men come from? It is described in the Vedic books themselves. They came from the north. Well, there is a lots of stuff north of India, but this Vedic Pandit pinned down their original location in the Arctic region, which, as we know, is the place where Hyperborea used to exist. In modern time, the entire Hyperborea is declared to be a fantasy, together with the Aryan people which were related to it or came from it. But the people who take to heart the teachings of the Sanatana Dharma consider them a real people and that seems to be the truth after all because in the Vedas it is described how they mixed with a portion of the locals and those were later assigned to be Brahmins, priests or rulers, Kshatriyas and till date in the Indian society the caste system established by these rishis or sages is functional and the DNA tests of those who belong to the higher castes clearly show the Caucasian genes that they have and also the people who belong to the higher castes are of a visibly lighter color. So the Aryans were real and tangible people, not less real than you yourself. Wherever we have the traditional stories of them coming and educating the locals, we also see their genes in the DNA tests and we also see the Aryan influence in the language. Despite all that, official historians prefer not to notice them. They want to keep their jobs, of course. And so modern people are given very general definitions of what an Aryan is, general to the point that it becomes meaningless. So, in the previous video, we touched on the subject of the origin of the various human races as mixtures of various tribes which lived on Earth and races from other planes or spheres of existence, and in some cases even other dimensions which mated with these tribes. Often, it was done purposefully, with the intention to create a new type of people. And very often, they would end up as the rulers of that given tribe and their offspring. The results of such mixtures would usually inherit some of the qualities of the non-human race, and this would be inclined to represent its interest while ruling the given nation or tribe, which as usual will have positive and negative effects. Although in the Western world, snakes and all kinds of reptilian creatures are hardly objects of reverence, this is not at all true for the Asian people. In many Asian traditions, they are considered as primeval forefathers and seed givers. Yes, exactly, seed givers for the people. Here in this Chinese city, they even erected a modern monument celebrating this union of the human and reptilian genes. In various regions of Asia, not everybody bows down to creatures of this type, but a lot of them do. Besides bowing down to them, they embrace them and kiss them. 
This is a real historic statue. Well, it disappeared recently, but that seems to be a pattern. It seems to happen to many important artifacts. That reveals the truth, and it's not an isolated fantasy artifact. There's a lot of this in the old Japanese books. So in certain areas of Russia, dwarfs like this have been spotted many times. There are a few corpses, also mummies, which are available. This is definitely not some rumor. It is a real thing, witnessed and studied by many. This one was actually alive, they killed him. But the interesting uh, connection with Japan here is that um, the Japanese officials showed very, very vivid interest in it. I think there were a couple of uh, TV uh, teams shooting a lot of material about this type of creatures. And the reason for this uh, vivid interest was that it turned out that in their traditional books they found uh, information that um, these are some of their worshipable deities and uh, even possibly genes from them were used in making their arrays. I even vaguely remember that in one of the materials I saw a long time ago there was also an old Japanese material similar to this one but depicting a creature exactly like the dwarf. And in addition to that, the Japanese team offered quite a solid sum of money. I believe it was uh, at least a million if not a couple of them for the corpse. They wanted to have it really badly. The offer was declined. And please don't get me wrong, I'm not implying that only the Asian uh, race has some uh, reptilian mixture in it. Similar depictions of uh, such beings mixing with people, that's why we, very often we see them in some sort of depictions connected with insemination or raising children. There is quite a few of them. This is from Panama, South America, Sumerian, and you can find many, many others easily on the internet. Egypt, of course. And here it says, found in China. I don't have any details, but it really looks like the skeleton of one of the scary fellows we saw in the previous depictions. So there was a lot of mixing going on all over the globe, but yet it is the Asian race exactly where the memories of it are most abundant. No matter at which historic, relatively recent period we take close look at, we always find some sort of dodgy stories in the official history. So, keeping this in mind, is there even a point to try to guess what was in the really, really ancient history of Japan? I think it's pointless. We simply lack available sources. For example, in this castle they found Roman and Ottoman coins. Well, okay, coins are relatively lighter, maybe it wasn't exactly Romans who brought them here. Although, after you watch the rest of the Survivor's episodes, you won't be surprised if the Romans did it indeed. But for the other, much heavier parts, like for example, things that look like spare parts of megaliths, it's much harder to find explanation, like for children, and that's why the modern quackademics simply ignore them. Hello everyone, we're in Japan and we are in the Nara prefecture of Japan and right now I'm standing atop what is locally called as the rock ship of Masuda. Oh. 
Moving on to Osaka Castle. Again, giant megalithic blocks, some of them weighing up to 100 tons. So on some of these stones, you see a lot of this like kind of notch work right here. And I noticed this also on the other stones that I showed you previously. And one of the guys told me, a local, said that they were used to break the stone off. Um, so you gotta wonder, maybe these stones were reused for something and they were used for something else uh, previous to building giant walls and things like that. Yes, it really looks like as if they chopped the older, bigger megaliths whenever they could to make the new ones. And according to the Russian group of LAI, Laboratory for Alternative History, they really made a serious expedition and tried to study the region, but uh, they found lots of sites which from outside gave the impression that they could be very interesting, huge megalithic work, but uh, they were fenced and uh, closed down for public access like forever and without any explanation. <laughs> 